My name is Father Tom Doyle, and I am delighted to welcome uh, my brothers and sisters in Holy Cross and our colleagues who serve with us at our institutions to this conference, this pre-conference that uh, allows us to mirror what it is that we were created to do and to be, to be brothers and sisters in service, uh, in the ministry and the apostle of education for the building of God's kingdom. Thank you for coming today. We'll look forward to the conversations that are ahead, and um, I wanted this morning to uh, give a different kind of introduction to our first speaker, Bishop Daniel Jenke. You have the bio in your folders that give you the formal introduction. Um, i just like to say that as a young priest, uh, and as a deacon, and as a seminarian, uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, then Father Jenke, who was the rector of Sacred Heart Basilica. In my time with him, I learned two things about him and from him. First of all is what it means to be a priest who loves the church, who loves the church because it has given him life and given him faith and birthed him, uh, and to love the church even though it was imperfect, uh, and to love it and try to serve it and make it the kind of community that God calls it to be. The other thing about Bishop Jenke that I recall is how much he loved the Congregation of Holy Cross. Uh, it was, in so many ways, um, such, a, such a significant part of his growing up and his education. And when the church that he loves very much called him to be a bishop, um, uh, I had known him at that point in time for um, almost 15 years, I saw a man go through one of the most traumatic experiences that I've ever watched somebody go through. The thought of leaving the direct service of the Congregation of Holy Cross to go serve the church, um, you know, called as bishop, um, was uh, an experience. It was as if um, there was a dying that was happening in him. Um, he was nervous beyond um, description. This was his home, Holy Cross, was the family that he had known. Uh, but because he loves Holy Cross and because he loves the church, um, he, uh, he answered that call. Right? And so it is with great pleasure and great pride that I welcome Bishop Jenke back to Notre Dame, uh, back to our campus, back to the shadows of the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, uh, to begin our conversation about who we are and what we are and what we are called to be as church and as brothers and sisters in Holy Cross. Bishop Jenke, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for being here. In that week or so before I was ordained a bishop, I bumped into Tom, uh, I think in front of Columba Hall. And he turned to me and said, Janky, you got to stop wearing crummy coats like that. <laughs> Go buy yourself a bishop's coat. So <laughs> I went to Michigan City and got a bishop's overcoat. <laughs> For believing Catholics, the era is extremely unsettling, challenging, because of the unprecedented pace of change. New technologies, new means of communication, advances in business, in trade, in industry, really change in every field of human enterprise, both fascinate and define most people's daily lives. There is a kind of general condescen condescension to the past. Familiar customs seem to disappear overnight, and there is enormous emotional dislocation. Older patterns, past structures, traditional norms, received values, all seem to be going through a radical process of deconstruction. It is a culture heady with its own power. Scientific and technical advances sometimes seem to explain away any need for faith or even for God. The dominant perspective, at least among the elites, is often hostile to religion in general and to Catholicism in particular. 
Catholic clergy, religious orders are under siege. Moral lapses are magnified by the popular media. And many religious congregations are uncertain about their role in the world or even uncertain about their will to survive. Some groups, some religious groups, wonder how they should be governed or how they should relate even to their own church. Many reasonable people of faith are tempted simply to retreat into their own spiritual world. And some appear to have lost the will to continue Christianity's great commission to win the whole world for Jesus Christ. Catholic schools struggle to maintain their religious identity and fulfill their spiritual role. In some schools, Catholic faith and practice are only remnants of what was once their reason for existing. Many struggle to resist the increasing control of the state, while some of the church's own bishops seem indifferent to the necessary role of religious schools in the life and future of the church. Now the era I am describing is, of course, the 19th century world into which Basile Antoine Marie Moreau was born and the world in which he served as a priest. The blessed founder of the Congregation of Holy Cross at absolutely every instant of his ministry lived in an era of revolution and enormous upheaval. Only in retrospect, only from hindsight, only from the perspective of history, only very much after the fact could the survival, much less the explosion of religious achievement of Catholic Christianity in the 19th century be appreciated. At the time, not much was clear, nothing was certain, very little was safe, and really, very little was predictable. Some thoughtful commentators in that era speculated that even the ancient Church of Rome could not survive the century. At that time, people of faith had to live by faith without the luxury of knowing what would be the final outcome of all their hard work. It was in these circumstances that the Congregation of Holy Cross was founded by Father Moreau to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to evangelize, educate, in a radically expanding world. And when it came to the journey of faith, Father Moreau, all his life long, clearly preferred to fight rather than to switch. He worked tirelessly to challenge whatever was unchristian about his culture and times, rather than to surrender or be assimilated into its grasp. In the dispirited, religious milieu of late Gallicanism, it was not uncommon to simply accept the status quo. Only monks and nuns need be holy. Only the clergy need to minister. Only professors need to be learned. And that only in the religious traditions of pre-revolutionary France could be found an authentic vision of Catholicism. Moreau's lifelong agenda was to challenge that closed and narrow view. He always labored to reunite the great spiritual triad of learning, holiness, and service in a single enterprise serving the Catholic Church. Religiously, he was imbued with all of what is called, usually, the French school of spirituality. This was France's response to all the challenges of a post-Reformation world. There was a remembering, a recollection of what is perennial in Catholic Christianity. This dynamic movement of prayer and service was based, first of all, upon appreciation of the glorified humanity of Christ, which makes the grace and mercy of God accessible to everyone to priests, religious, and laity, to saints and sinners alike. For the great teachers and mystics of this tradition, and certainly for Basil Moreau, the heart of Jesus was a furnace of love, 
and the whole church on earth, which is his body, needed to be animated by the same power of that agapic love. Heart to heart, Mary above all others embodied the wondrous gift of her son's generous and surprising goodness. Mary was the model of Christian prayer and service, grounded in faith, based on love. Our Lady was the living icon of discipleship, the gate of heaven, the seat of wisdom, vita dulcedo et spes. The Eucharist, the sacrament of Christ's abiding presence, was re-emphasized and more intensely promoted as nourishment, not only for devotion, but for service in a church called to fervor and called to be on fire with love. It was in this passionate spiritual conviction that Basil Moreau, as a young priest, was appointed a professor of theology at the Grand Seminary in Le Mans. Moreau later became a canon of the Cathedral of St. Julien. He founded the Visitation Convent of Le Mans, and by his preaching and his long hours offering spiritual direction and his willingness to spend quality time with the laity, he became one of the most prominent priests of his own diocese. Originally, he was taught, assigned to teach dogma, but because of his enthusiasm for new methods in seminary education, his attempts to introduce science and modern literature into the curriculum, his profound dissatisfaction with the accepted levels of seminary spirituality, but most of all, because because of his unwavering support and his enthusiasm for a more international understanding of the church, Moro was demoted from teaching dogma to teaching scripture. With characteristic determination, he taught himself Hebrew and became an enthusiastic teacher of the Bible. Dom Guéranger, a faculty colleague and a lifelong friend, he was the one of the early founders of the modern liturgical movement. And he went on to refound the great Benedictine Abbey of St. Pierre de Salem. Moreau was a popularizer of Guéranger's scholarship. Besides Moreau's many pamphlets and books promoting prayer, promoting liturgical participation, and hymn singing, it was Moreau's custom on weekends to travel out to the country parishes with a canvas bag full of hymn books. He would preach and instruct, give retreats, teach the commons of the mass, introduce hymns, and encourage renewal in a largely dispirited church, still barely recovering from the fierce persecutions of the French Revolution and the devastating world wars of Napoleon. Among the seminarians who accompanied these evangelical efforts Attracted by Moro's enormous zeal was Edward Frederick Soren, who chose Moro as his own spiritual director and, of course, would later become the renowned founder of this University of Notre Dame. When Moro was given responsibility for the government of the Brothers of St. Joseph, a congregation of teaching brothers, he was inspired to unite with them an association of like-minded priests. The new religious community, the Congregation of Holy Cross, made up of both priests and brothers, was established in 1837 as educators in the faith. Now, although I have been dispensed by the Pope for my vows of poverty and obedience, they might have given me a choice about which vows. Anyway, I am still very much a member of my community and I would certainly identify myself as a spiritual son of Father Moreau. And I think I can say without any prejudice, our founder was a religious genius. His personal charism became our common charism and the guiding inspiration for all our schools and apostolates. His heroic holiness became the challenging model for those unique, and effective structures that he gave to the religious family he founded. From the beginning, Holy Cross was to be apostolic. 
We were founded to exercise the public ministry of the sacrament of holy orders to preach, sanctify, and shepherd. But united with this sacerdotal service was the apostolate of the brothers, who as teachers and in so many other essential ways supported the common work of the entire congregation. For in Moro's intentional design, Holy Cross was called to be familial in its style of community life and in its institutions. The congregation existed for ministry, but that ministry was to be invigorated by a recognizable family spirit living and serving in common, united by bonds of love and friendship, and energized by the evangelical vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Common work, common prayer, common life, and the love and friendship of brother for brother was to constitute the reality of our lives together. The spiritual ideal was the Holy Family in Nazareth that lived in unity and supported one another in perfect love. The priests were to serve according to the heart of Jesus. The brothers were to serve in imitation of the prudence and fidelity of St. Joseph. And the sisters, who were founded somewhat later, were to serve faithfully like Mary, the first and greatest of the Lord's disciples. Our Lady of Sorrows, Notre Dame de Saint Croix, whose own holy and immaculate heart was pierced through with swords of love, who remained faithful even beneath the Holy Cross, was to be the patron of the entire congregation. Moro never tired of urging his spiritual family always to see Jesus through the luminous eyes of Notre Dame and to imitate, imitate her great love and her willing obedience to the Holy Spirit. The experiment began at Holy Cross's first school, Collège Notre Dame de Saint Croix, built in a suburb of Le Mans. It was a French Catholic boarding school, but one where the Holy Cross community could be found as often in the kitchens and fields as in the lecture halls. Most of the religious lived closely with the student residents in a 19th century version of what today we would call residentiality. The role of the priests and brothers was never intended to be confined only to the classroom. They were challenged by Moreau to share their lives as well as their learning. The schedule of the school intentionally revolved around the Mass and the sacraments, and the Holy Eucharist was enshrined in the conventual church, which was the founders of pride and joy. Father Moreau was convinced that liturgical renewal was essential for the life of the church, and he even believed in a certain deliberate splendor in the public worship that was always to be at the heart of his school's institutional identity. Moro was not afraid of new ideas. He wanted his educational apostolates to be up to date, both in methodology and curriculum. But he was also unswervingly loyal to the received deposit of the Catholic faith, to the definitive authority of the magisterium, and to the pastoral role of the Pope of Rome. Despite, I might add, the determined opposition of his local Gallican bishop and Moreau's own political ineptness with dealing with the Roman Curia. Moreau also continued to encourage service. His priests and brothers were urged to sacrifice their weekends, even their school holidays, to conduct rural missions and contribute to parish education. Father Moreau actively promoted lay collaboration for the direction, the finance, and the continuing influence of his schools. He sought out people of the world in order to promote the work of the kingdom. He also stayed very close to what today we would call his alumni association, his lay supporters, and most especially those who had studied at Notre Dame de Saint Croix. They continued to be intensely loyal to him throughout the many dramatic ups and downs of his long and rather complicated priestly career. Now, does this initial program sound familiar to all of you? 
who serve today in the 21st century in schools sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross? Have you noticed that beside the main chapels that typically are at the center of our campuses, there are also chapels usually in the dorms and sometimes even in the academic buildings where Mass is celebrated and where the Eucharist is reserved? Here at Notre Dame, you kind of have to wonder if there's any other place on earth except for Lourdes, where Mary is more deeply and universally revered than at her school on her campus. And except for the fact that it means so much to us, don't you almost grow tired of always hearing about the special family spirit in all our Holy Cross schools? And are not the tensions of modernity and fidelity, of this world and the world to come, of the pursuit of excellence and the pursuit of holiness, don't they continue to challenge and define our school missions? I would dare to assert that most of what is beloved, most of what is unique, most of what is almost taken for granted in Holy Cross schools can trace its inspiration directly to the charism of Blessed Moreau. Moreau once wrote to his religious confreres, an education that is complete is one in which the hands and the heart are engaged as much as the mind. He also declared that we want to let our students try their learning in the world and so make prayers of their education. Now there's an old adage that observes it's a wise child that recognizes the voice of their own father. So it would be wise both for Holy Cross and our lay colleagues to once again hear the voice of Father Moreau as we endeavor to renew our tradition in education. Father Soren, Notre Dame's founder, was among the first four priests to make their profession of vows in Holy Cross, one by one, kneeling before Blessed Moreau with their hands enfolded in his. Uh, he was their spiritual father. In some significant ways, Soren's great pragmatism, his enormous political skills, and his very direct and forceful style of leadership perhaps made him more effective as our third superior general in promoting and institutionalizing the charism of Moreau than was Moreau himself. But in this post soren era, in all our schools, in France, in America, in Canada, in Bangladesh, in India, in Latin America, in Africa, an irreplaceable foundation for our future must be the work of remembering our past. The world today simply doesn't need more private schools. There are plenty out there, perhaps too many, but the world today and the church do need more Catholic schools that remember who they are. The identity of any Catholic school is both a distinction and an opportunity, a great challenge and a unique grace. If it was the critical task of the 20th century, to ensure that Catholic colleges would be true colleges, accepted academically by their peer secular institutions, it is perhaps just as vital in this 21st century to ensure that our schools also continue to be unashamedly Catholic, morally grounded, and qualitatively self-consciously different from purely secular schools to be homogenized into the undifferentiated academic culture of most schools today would constitute a colossal loss of nerve and a sad, perhaps a shameful, shameful betrayal of the church's academic tradition. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should never be like everyone else. Existing at the heart of the church should make Catholic schools better Think of the Lord we serve. Think of the history that is ours. Think of the tradition of learning, the gift of culture, the spirit of holiness, the commitment to service, the shared sense of community that constitutes the educational heritage of the Catholic Church. Our own CSE schools should never 
choose between being excellent or being Catholic. A school in the Holy Cross tradition should not be either or, but rather both and. Catholicity in itself both has both identity and universality. I should have had another cup of coffee this morning. Catholic tradition in all its ancient variety and richness is so profound, so wide, and so self-confident in its own exploration of the truth that it can dare to ask questions and it can dare to promote dialogue. The excitement, the energy, and sometimes even the passionate dissonance of disputatio all are a valued part of our intellectual heritage. They were as well known to the fathers of the church as to the great lecture halls of the first medieval universities that our church invented. Catholicism exposes needs and a power's capacities that can fill the human heart with amazement, the intellectual life with the light of the gospel, and the academic enterprise with profound purpose. The community experience, the vast exhilaration of worship, can humanize the rigor of the intellectual life and give both students and professors an enduring passion for learning and a deeper capacity for wonder. A hunger for knowledge, a commitment to justice, the connections between science and mysticism, friendship and generosity, and especially the transforming experience of God give hope and meaning to academic inquiry. Scholarship and teaching if pursued in the context of faith, should be open to a truth that is without end, that enlarges our hope and diminishes our apprehensions. Catholic colleges in general and all Holy Cross schools in particular are therefore called by our confidence in the gospel to be the yeast in the loaf of higher education and make a singular contribution both in our own church and to the educational mosaic of the wider world. So our schools can never think and act just like every other school, politically correct, unquestioning, and totally submissive to all the cultural dogmas of this moment. The Universal Church and the world does need excellent schools that have the conviction to be true to themselves and therefore stand out rather than blend in. The culture of this 21st century certainly has more than its own share of the daunting problems that faced Moreau in the 19th century. But our critical test is to have Moreau's deep faith, his relentless energy, and his boundless commitment. And this challenge is not just for Holy Cross religious or for the priests and religious of other communities who share in our ministries, the role of the laity is today a valued, in fact, an irreplaceable component of all the schools served by Holy Cross. Laymen and women now serve and give leadership at every level of faculty, staff, and administration. Without their learning, their wide experience, their creativity, our schools could simply no longer exist. But all of us, religious and laity alike, must be engaged in Christian witness and not be ashamed of our mission to evangelize. I think we need more faith sharing in all our schools and in all our departments and not just in theology classes, in student affairs, and in campus ministry. I would therefore assert that it is a part of the irreplaceable mission of Holy Cross to pass on the conviction that Catholic schools exist not only to educate, but to sanctify. That our schools are not only devoted to producing success, but also to producing saints. Moro believed that our schools, if they remained loyal to the insights of faith, could achieve great things for God and neighbor. He never expected the world to always agree with him. He never thought the task would be easy. He never wanted to teach and study the way everyone else did. He did believe 
that his schools were called to be assigned to this world and actually to exist in imitation of the Trinity. Like the Son of God in whom we are redeemed, we are to receive all from the Father. Like the Lord Jesus Christ whose body we are, we are to surrender our hearts to prayer and our lives to giving, always in accordance with the Father's will. Like the Holy Spirit, we are to love and glorify the Son and the Father in all we say and do. As Morrow wrote in his own unmistakable style, our community and our schools must always be formed in the image of the triune God. In God there is a community of persons, but all form but one being. Thus all our affections, our desires, all our work and action, everything should lead to the same will. So our church, our congregation, our schools are called to be tangible expressions on earth of the heavenly community of love that is the triune God. The educational charism at its heart in Holy Cross should therefore be no less than accepting the life of the Trinity as the paradigm of our educational apostolate. I know this congregational formula might appear incomprehensible to many, perhaps foolish to some among the academic elites, certainly a stumbling block to unbelievers, but it is salvation and life without end for all those whom God has called to his life. This was Morrow's educational program, to turn teachers into evangelizers and students into saints. And this goal of uniting holiness, learning, and service is as valid, as necessary today as it ever was in the past. That is what Holy Cross's educational program should be all about. And that is what our schools should always be about. As was the case in past post-revolutionary France, as was the case amid rapid expansion and industrial progress in the late 19th century, as that was true during the 10 decades of unprecedented development in the 20th century, it's simply true to surrender utterly to the dominant academic culture would mean the extinction of our identity. As Father Jenkins, Notre Dame's current president, said so eloquently when he was inaugurated as president, combining religious faith and academic excellence is not widely, widely emulated or even greatly admired among the opinion makers of higher ed. But for Catholic schools, the duty is timeless as its challenge is new in each age and particularly pressing in this age. The struggle to be Catholic in a secular world places our schools at the front line of the culture wars. Again, Father Jenkins said, we have not just an opportunity, but a duty to think and speak and act in ways that will guide and inspire and heal. If we are afraid to be different from the world, how can we ever make a difference in the world? For all of us assembled here today, especially at this precise moment in our history, we must have the courage to be what we are. But it does remain to be seen in this 21st century of the Christian era whether or not all of us, all in religious life, all our lay colleagues and collaborators, our students, faculty, alumni, and benefactors, are we up to the challenge? Through the providence of Almighty God, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, the prayers and protection of Our Lady, I believe we are. God bless you.